Hey guys, how are you doing today? Just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everybody for liking and subscribing. Uh, we got up to 50 subscribers, which is awesome. Thank you guys so much. Got a little bit of a different type of story for you guys today, uh, obviously by the name of the title, but it's definitely a crazy one. And if you like stories like this one, don't forget to like and subscribe and definitely leave a comment down below because we're going to do a whole series about stories like this covering the GTA region in Toronto and definitely would love to hear your guys' suggestions. Without further ado, let's get right into this. Canada has gained a reputation for one of the safest countries in the world, with averaging only about 800 homicides per year. The story for Toronto though is completely different. It matches up to pretty much any rough city you would see in the United States. In 2019, it had a higher murder rate in both New York and London. By the end of the year, Toronto would have over 97 homicides, and that's not including the GTA region. And if you live in Canada, pretty much every day you're going to see an insane story popping off from Toronto. And it's funny because a lot of people here always say that they wouldn't step foot in some American cities. But like I said before, it's about as deadly as any American city and actually surpasses some of them. And today we're going to go into the story of probably one of the most ruthless street gangs ever to hit the streets of the GTA in Scarborough known as the Galloway Boys. Today, they're probably one of the most infamous street gangs in all of Canada. But before we get into why it's like this, let's start from the beginning. Canada has a very rich black history, but we'll save that story for another day. We'll go back when Canada seen its largest wave of immigration from Jamaica and the Caribbean islands. Canada's population sits at about 38 million, and out of those 38 million, 3.5% are black. And out of that 3.5%, 50% of them come from Jamaican heritage. Today, you can hear people say jokes like there's more Jamaicans in Toronto than actual Jamaica, and have ingrained themselves as a part of the Canadian identity. Many who came here in the beginning would settle in the Toronto and GTA region. But back in the 1960s and 70s, Toronto looked very different from what it is today. Scarborough today is considered a major city of Canada due to its population density, its size, and its closeness to the city of Toronto. The GTA is made up of 25 municipalities and six cities. The immigrants would make their way to the Kingston Galloway section of Scarborough in the south end of the city. And some Jamaican youths would actually bring with them a gangster subculture from back home. Because back home, these were the guys they looked up to. And one dark secret that Canada holds is that it hasn't always been as accepting as it has been today. So many of these young men feel some sort of sense of belonging and community would form a gang known as the Get Mad Crew. They formed in the 1980s, and by the 1990s, they were actually heavily involved in the sale of drugs and illegal firearms. And the youths that were first generation Canadians, they looked up to them. And just like the Get Mad crew, they would also start forming gangs of their own, in a sense of maybe wanting to fit in, or the victim becoming the aggressor type of mentality. Because many white neighborhoods around the Galloway section of Scarborough uh, actually looked down on the black community and referred to that section of Scarborough as Scarlem or Scar Town, where the terms actually spread out and pretty much everybody just refers to them like that today. Scar Town obviously meant to signify how dangerous that part of the city was and Scarlem to be a disparaging comment referring to them like Harlem. But like I said, many of these young men, they would form posses and crews, is what they called them, and one of them was called the Galloway Posse. They started out pretty much as petty criminals, but as the 90s went on, uh, they would get involved in robberies and street distribution of drugs. And by 2000, they would become a highly organized street gang. They were already pretty well known in Toronto, but they would gain countrywide attention when a beef kicked off with a rival gang known as the Melvin Crew, leading to numerous homicides. 
the Malvern crew, but from the Malvern section of Scarborough, and they were another tight-knit group like the Galloway Posse. It started over control of the drug trade, and the police, they would have their work cut out for them, as they would be getting calls from the Galloway and Melbourne section of Scarborough back to back, as every day there would be shootings, home invasions, and robberies. Seeing sirens roll up to this part of town just became second nature to the citizens living in these sections of the city. Both the Malvern crew and the Galloway posse would become the most feared gangs in all of Canada, and the police would refer to the Galloway posse as the Galloway boys. The members would adopt the name, some of them shortening it to G-Way. And as the culture and ideology of the gang grew, so did the influence. And by 2002, a man named Norris Allen would actually become a high-ranking member. And many of the other guys looked up to him. He was seen as untouchable and a kingpin in the streets of Scarborough, but unfortunately, on October 10th, 2002, Norris Allen was sitting in his car listening to music when two men rolled up and opened up fire. He was pronounced dead at the scene and he left behind two children. A man named Tashawn Riley would take his place. Furious from the murder of his friend, he would form a vicious subset of the Galloway Boys, known as the Throwbacks. This subset was pretty much a group of assassins, and their main target would be the Melvin crew, with the streets of Scarborough suffering the effects as well. There would be multiple shootings carried throughout the city, but just two weeks after Norris being killed, they would claim their first victim. 23-year-old Eric Motisa. And not shortly after this, they would solidify their reputation as a well-armed vicious gang because they would rob an armed dealer's house while he was away on vacation, inquiring an assortment of automatic rifles and pistols. Numerous other shootings had been carried out, but by 2004, the violence had reached another level. When on March 3rd, two men were sitting in their car at a red light, Brenton Carlton, age 31, and Leonard Bell, age 44. A group of three men would roll up next to them, misidentifying them as members of the Melvin crew, and then proceeded to unleash a hail of bullets on the two men. Brenton Carlton would unfortunately pass away, and leaving Leonard Bell horrifically scarred from the situation. The three men involved in the shooting were Tashawn Riley, Philip Atkins, and Jason Wisdom, all part of G-Way's throwbacks. The police began closely monitoring Tashawn Riley and the three men, but Riley would still manage to gun down two teenagers. Fortunately, they would end up surviving the shooting, and this forced the police to make an arrest on all three of them. And now the police had all the evidence they needed to take down Tashawn Riley. Riley and Atkins both received two life sentences. With Jason Wisdom receiving one life sentence, he always claimed innocence and was released in 2017. And I definitely encourage you guys to look into his story a little bit more because it's a really interesting one and I'm really interested to see what you guys think about it. Deshaun Riley would also receive another two life sentences for the shooting of the teenagers. And with Tashawn Riley out of the picture, this left other members to take his place. Their beef with the Melvin crew was solidified and things from here would only get more and more violent. The Galloway boys would also see some inner rivalry with each other when the throwbacks split off into their own subset It also created another subset known as the Bad Seeds. With the throwbacks having alliances with Crips and the Bad Seeds having an alliance with the Bloods, this would only further the separation of the two subsets. It wasn't all-out warfare between the two of them though, because they still had a common enemy in the Melvin crew. Things seemed to calm down quite a bit after Tashan's arrest. This would give some time for the Galloway boys to reorganize and then re-solidify themselves in the streets after the huge arrest. This only created more infighting within the gang, as they would fight over who would control what territory. This wouldn't matter because they were igniting a beef with another gang known as the Orton Park Bloods. And between the fighting with Melvin's crew and this new threat, their own internal beef would have to be put on hold while they dealt with this situation. 
This complex gang war between the three of them would lead to all of their demise. The war would fully erupt on September 4th, 2011, when three men were shot outside of a Domino's pizza. All three men would survive their injuries, but the Orton Park Bloods would strike back. On November 28th, a Galloway Boy member was shot three times in the back of the neck. Fortunately, he also survived this encounter. The shootings were becoming so commonplace that the police were actually having trouble deciphering who was part of what gang. December 28th, another three members of the Galloway Boys were shot. They also survived their injuries. And then in another case of mistaken identity, Dimitri Barnaby, age 24, was shot and killed when he was mistaken for an Orton Park blood. Then on July 16th, 2012, all hell would break loose. But this time it was between their old rival, the Melvin crew. This altercation would happen on Danzig Street and is one of the most notorious massacres in Canadian history. While Melvin crew members were attending a barbecue on Danzig Street, two other Galloway boys rolled up. A verbal altercation would break out before shots were fired. The two gangs opened up on each other, firing into a large crowd. They injured 24 people and unfortunately they killed two innocent people. Cheyenne Charles, who is only 14 years old, and Joshua Yose, age 23. The Galloway boys were also linked to the killing of Dimitri Barnaby. The Galloway boys' rap sheet was endless. Not only were they gunning down rival gang members, they would fire indiscriminately no matter who was around. Various other shootings would occur over the following months, the most serious of which a G-Way member was killed on Orton Park Blood Turf. The Danzig barbecue shooting was the largest mass shooting in Canadian history at that time. And the police had their hands completely full. Just the Galloway boys were linked to several homicides and the killing of three innocent people. Leading the Toronto police to launch Operation Pathfinder, where they arrested 41 members of all three gangs Police would lay over 400 charges. Tashawn Riley, like previously mentioned, was given another 17 years. And Shaquan Mosquito, Florenza Uwozi, Nohan Segazab, and Noad Segazab were all convicted and charged for the shooting on Danzig Street. This was the last nail in the coffin for the Galloway boys and the new generations of G-Way fixated on their new alliances with Crips and Bloods, would begin beefing with each other. And today they're very much still active and are actually represented by a couple of rappers in the Toronto scene. I'm gonna leave them unnameless because I honestly don't wanna link these guys to anything like this. Cause like I said, they're a completely new generation of guys and have absolutely no ties or links uh, to any of these crimes I previously talked about. But I just thought this story was crazy. Uh, I actually grew up in St. Catharines, not too far away from Toronto. And growing up, I heard a lot of crazy stories of uh, pretty much the gang wars that were going on there. I just remember being a kid and literally reading of like cars blowing up in the middle of Toronto and just shootings happening every day. Um, it just seemed like complete chaos and uh, my heart really does go out for all the families of the people involved in these uh, situations. Um, like I said, it's really, really just a sad story. It wasn't until I got older though that I researched more about it and fully understood how chaotic it was at that time. And things are getting pretty crazy again, uh, but I'd like to leave on a positive note. Hopefully with this new generation of kids uh, putting their efforts into music, it seems like a pretty positive change from what we've seen in the past, and hopefully it just keeps going that way. But like I said, it's gotten completely complex. Um, I was gonna do a video actually of what's going on uh, more today uh, in Toronto, and there are just so many separate cliques and gangs and when you look it up your your head basically just explodes that's the only way i know how to describe it and i think most people think that it's just bloods versus crips but not even in los angeles today is it like that 
it's been generations since these gangs have been around so alliances and beefs they come and go but i really hope you guys enjoyed this one uh like i said we're gonna be doing this series uh i don't know how often probably upload it once a month or something like that um, but I'm going to cover other uh, cities uh, within the GTA, not just Scarborough, obviously. Um, but like I said, I don't really want to cover anything that's uh, especially going on today. I don't want to get anybody in trouble or anything like that. But I just thought that this story definitely needed to get out there because I just thought it was absolutely insane when I was researching it. If you guys have any suggestions for upcoming videos like this one, don't forget to leave it in the comments down below and uh, I'll definitely look into it. That being said, again, thank you guys so much for the support and I hope you guys have a great one.